Um, so I am um, tonight here to talk to you about my recently published book, Fugitive Science. Um, and this is a book that traces um, a little known history of anti-racist science across the 19th century. And I mostly focus on the antebellum period. Um, so in this book, um, I'm interested in um, tracing a history of um, African-American activists, writers, performers, and artists um, who are really interested in um, combating emerging forms of racial science during this period. Um, but I'm also, and maybe even more interested, in the ways in which black activists, writers, and artists um, were really interested in emerging sciences and actually wanted to use science within emancipation struggles. Um, so this is a project that emerged when I was doing some, um, uh, some research into and exploring into early black periodicals that had recently been digitized. Um, and I had written a dissertation project that was sort of about histories of exploitative experiments on enslaved people in plantation spaces. And so when I started looking at these periodicals, I expected to find that history reflected there. Um, and I did see a little bit of that. Um, I saw um, critiques of forms of racial science and really racist science during this period. Um, I saw rumors about these kinds of experiments and regimes of exploitation um, going on during this period. But I also found um, this really robust and mostly positive discourse on science. And this just like kind of blew me away. It actually really floored me. Um, so I found in something like the North Star, Frederick Douglass's um, would advertise um, uh, instruments for astronomy, micro Telescopes, telescopes, um, discourses on um, many, a range of different forms of science. This was really surprising, and it sort of um, caused me to want to write a different type of book. Um, so we know the history um, of kind of racial science and a history of sort of exploitation of communities and populations in large part because that continues to happen today. Um, and I sort of started to realize that the real kind of power of that narrative and the intensity of that narrative had actually kind of obscured the question of resistance. And it turns out that at every turn, people have resisted and refused forms of scientific exploitation. So that's sort of how the project emerged. Um, so the first thing is that tonight you'll actually hear me talk about very few professionally trained scientists and physicians. Um, and the reason for that is because this is a period before the professionalization and standardization of both science and medicine. Um, so this is a period in the antebellum period in the pre-Civil War period when science is being practiced by many different actors in many different types of settings. Um, so that's one of the reasons why you're going to hear me talk about some figures and maybe some context where you might ask yourself, hmm, does that actually count in science? count as science. And what I would argue during this period, a lot of things actually count as science. Um, the second reason why I won't address um, too many professionally trained physicians and scientists is because in this period, um, with um, only a few exceptions, African Americans are, were being excluded from um, institutions of um, scientific and medical training. Um, and so what I realized sort of early on in this project was that um, in order to tell this story, um, sort of more traditional archives of science and medicine actually weren't going to be very helpful for me. Um, so that's why, you know, I have, there's a real focus in this book on art and literature and performance, um, and I sort of realized that in order to tell this history of how African Americans in this period engaged with science and the various ways that they did so, you actually have to look to non-scientific archives. Um, so that's a little bit about how this project kind of took shape. Um, I have two two definitions for this evening. Um, and then I'll show some images and sort of get to, into some of the details of this project. But I realized as I was writing this talk and preparing for tonight that it might be helpful to know um, or for me to say a little bit about how I define these two terms, 
So the first is the term racial science. Um, so when I say racial science, at least in this period, I'm talking about those sciences that were interested in the study of human difference. So in this period, that would mean craniology, physiology, comparative anatomy, um, and actually a whole set of other related um, fields. In this period, um, in, the, the, um, in terms of the history that I trace and looking at um, this kind of history, the practitioners of what I call fugitive science, they often held out a kind of hope that um, a racial science could emerge that was untethered from racism, that was kind of um, could be detached from structures of hate and oppression and colonialism and enslavement. Um, so I think that is sort of fugitive science at its most um, optimistic and most utopian. But usually when you hear me use the term racial science, I'm talking about racist science, right? So sciences that are investigating human, dis um, human difference, that are um, creating um, taxonomies of race in order to create hierarchies that sort of buttress conditions of slavery, colonialism, and white supremacy. Um, my second definition is polygenesis, um, and this is a term you'll hear me um, talk about uh, um, uh, probably several times. Um, polygenesis is something that the figures in my book were really pissed off about. Um, these are sort of ideas about um, descent and evolution that had been um, going on for a long time, but were sort of gaining new life in the early 19th century um, as the kind of um, struggle for emancipation is, is building um, strength and energy, and as the, indeed the kind of reaction against those arguments and those movements is taking shape. So polygenesis is the idea idea that um, the races of humankind were created in multiple creation events by God. Does that make sense? It's a kind of, we think about Darwin's um, origin of species, polygenesis is the idea that God originally created the races and created them in separate origin events, separate creation events. So polygenesis, um, you can think about it in terms of it kind of goes beyond um, theories of um, physical and intellectual inferiority to sort of um, suggest that there's also a kind of biblically ordained um, theory of segregation, right? That the races are basically um, originally created by God and created separately in different places. Um, so, my hope is that tonight, um, I hope that you'll see um, many connections to the CHF's Fall Festival on Belief. Um, so the first thing I would say in terms of thinking about um, belief in fugitive science is that this is a group who had very strong convictions about the dangers of racial science. Um, um, this group included some figures like Frederick Douglass, who actually had a, had a sometimes almost annoyingly utopian view about um, what science and technology could do in terms of the world's progress. Some of the other figures in my book um, were a little bit, were sort of dissenters from that view and were more critical of science itself. But Douglas, for example, was one figure who really kind of had this belief in um, um, what science and technology could do in terms of human emancipation and progress. And he had this deep conviction, and he'll say over and over and over again, again, that these, these guys, these polygenesis, that their science is groundless. He'll say that it's false. And he'll even go so far as to say that this is um, a field who, of composed of, um, he never actually credits them as being scientists. He says that they dare to speak in the name of science, right? And so Douglas, unlike some of the other figures in my book who are doing kind of wilder and weirder experiments with science, Douglas is one who does kind of want to maintain the integrity of science itself. 
Um, and so um, I think there's a sort of inter interesting structure of belief there. Um, I also have been sort of playing around with this idea that polygenesis might um, be a part or may maybe might be one of the first sites of the kind of secularization of science. Um, this is a theory that you might imagine. Um, it might sound like it's something um, that would have been widely, um, uh, sort of widely believed or disseminated in the plantation south because it's a theory that could be used to justify slavery. Um, and so it's definitely a kind of anti-black theory. But polygenesis, at least in the US South, was not actually um, believed or adhered to widely because it departs from scriptural authority on the descent of the races, right? The Bible is actually pretty clear about one creation event, one Adam, one Eve, and that is the beginning of humankind. Um, so these guys, these kind of, um, uh, these figures of the polygenesis, they were um, actually more like kind of fringe figures. They were often not sort of the enter, at, the, at the center of institutions of, of um, um, sort of academic institutions or scientific institutions. Um, and they in fact sort of felt like that they were on the, um, uh, the kind of margins of a broader scientific field. Um, and in fact, I would say this doesn't mean that their work was marginal. It actually means that in some ways it was more nefarious because they were pop they were disseminating this work in sort of more popular channels, right? So through popular print, through newspaper, on stage, right? But it's not the case that they were the kind of hegemonic scientists during this period. And interestingly, I would say, you know, I like to think about these polygenesis that um, they're um, pretty strong on hate, but they're actually pretty weak on conviction. I think that they were actually pretty cynical. Um, and so one of the ways, and I think there's a kind of history of sincerity in this history of fugitive science. And one of the things that many of the figures in my book do is you sort of see them trying to oppose the kind of cynicism and the hatefulness of polygenesis with a kind of sincerity and even what um, Frederick Douglass will talk about as a kind of politics of love. Um, so I think that belief is actually really key here to this, this history that I'm gonna trace. Okay, so let me get into some images and tell you a little bit about the kind of um, deeper content of this book. Um, so I really did not want this book to be about Thomas Jefferson. I can't tell you how much I did not want this book to be about Thomas Jefferson, um, but it, it became a book in some ways about Thomas Jefferson. And the reason for that is because of um, Thomas Jefferson's um, notorious text that was published in the seven, first in the 1780s called Notes on the State of Virginia. Um, so this is a work that in many ways was a kind of uncontroversial uncontroversial um, text of natural history. It was first written when Jefferson was living um, in France. So he talks in this work about the kind of flora and fauna of Virginia. He talks about laws and customs in Virginia. Um, but then there's this very nefarious and indeed infamous section of this text, um, Query 14, where Jefferson talks about the kind of racial composition of the new United States of the emerging nation. Um, and what Jefferson says in this text is that there's a lot of hope for the cultivation, that's a paternalistic language, right? For the cultivation of indigenous peoples in North America. But when it comes to people of African descent, Jefferson speculates that there isn't that same hope for cultivation, and he speculates on the possibility that people of African descent may be a different type of human being. This is before a kind of species language, right? But he uses this language of type, he definitely uses this language of inferiority, and he kind of sets up this hierarchy where, where you have whites and the possible indigenous populations and, and people of African descent, right, separated from that. So this is a work that ends up being really, really crucial for this history of fugitive science that I trace in this book. Um, and so um, this is a text that will be responded to by black writers across the early national period and into the antebellum period. So that raises a question of like, why did black writers and intellectuals respond so passionately to this one text, 
is because, as you can see by those dates up there, this is a text that will be published and republished and republished over and over and over again. Um, so in part, every time that there's a republication, you have black writers and intellectuals who are responding back to the publication of this text, right? Um, and actually, the black response to this text happens almost immediately. So in the 1790s, Benjamin Banneker is already penning a response countering Jefferson's claims in this text. Something, these um, responses happened throughout the antebellum period, and something that I found really fascinating in my research is that even in 1859, right, so two years before the start of the Civil War, um, James McCune Smith, who was um, a black intellectual and was a professionally trained physician in this period, writes a critique of notes on the state of Virginia. And I think that's kind of incredible to think that in 1859, black intellectuals see this as being such a dangerous and pernicious work that they can continue to respond to it. The other reason why um, black writers and intellectuals like Banneker, James McCune Smith, um, David Walker, many other writers of this time um, continue to respond to um, notes on the state of Virginia um, is because Jefferson does something, it's, this is very 18th century, this is before the rise of biology. He speculates on um, the kind of status of, of blackness and the kind of biological status of blackness. He says, you know, I don't, I'm I'm not sure, we, we don't really have enough evidence to prove that this is the case, that people of African descent are originally and naturally inferior, but I think it's the case. And then he goes on to basically open up an invitation that what we need is more proof. And he, he actually, in the text, invites for um, uh, invites comparative anatomists and other figures, you might imagine plantation doctors figures, to, what, um, um, to actually experiment on African Americans. So black intellectuals recognize this, and so they don't see um, Jefferson's kind of wishy-washy speculation as being um, benign. They see it as being a pernicious invitation, right? And so that's part of the reason why their responses by people like um, Robert Benjamin Lewis on the left here, um, James Pennington on the upper right corner, and this is David Walker's Appeal. This is actually W.E.B. Du Bois's copy of Walker's Appeal. This is part of the reason why they continue to respond to this nefarious text. Um, some of them, like Walker's Appeal, um, is a pretty direct takedown of Jefferson's hateful theories, um, but something I realized in doing this research that was really fascinating was um, I have black intellectuals dragged Thomas Jefferson. I realized at some point if this was a um, post-tenure book, I might have called it black intellectuals troll Thomas Jefferson because that's actually what they were doing. They were pretty experimental in terms of how they were engaging with Jefferson. Um, James Pennington, who uh, was a um, former slave and Methodist preacher um, in Hartford, Connecticut, he will not, um, he sees the connection between Jefferson and these new polygenesists in the period, um, and he will basically won't even say their name. He calls them the stupid. And there's a so there's a section of this book where he says, he says, we are, we are not the sons of Ham as the stupid say, right? And I just love the fact that many of these figures refuse to legitimate this anti-black science, right? Um, satire is very, very, very important for them. Um, there's mockery of Jefferson that I think is a valid and really important sort of tool in terms of fighting this form of racial science. Um, so that's really, really key. Um, and then you also have, you see this a little bit in Pennington's work, but also newspaper articles um, in black newspapers, um, critiques of Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia, um, where you have writers who basically do these kind of imaginative, they're like these graveyard scenes where they do these imaginative sort of um, exhuming of Jefferson's body, right? Um, and this m makes sense and sort of has an important resonance since that is actually what Jefferson was encouraging in notes on the state of Virginia, right? And so you can imagine the kind of politics of what do you want to think about that act where it's like sort of t taking this discourse back and saying, well, why don't, why don't we dig up Jefferson and, and maybe we can investigate whiteness by doing the same thing to him, right? 
So I guess when I sort of started out by saying I didn't want this book to be about Thomas Jefferson, what I realized, because of the existence of this text, what I realized was that um, Jefferson's notes on the state of Virginia became this really important text around which this vibrant black intellectual network actually took shape. And so these writers, they continue to kind of look back and they continue to cite Jefferson, but I have a pet theory. I think I'm right. I'm going to do a little bit more research. This is like maybe the first time that black writers in the United States are actually writing to one another and actually citing one another in a kind of sustained way. Um, it's also a kind of key site. This is an intellectual network that's happening in New England. Um, so it also becomes a key site for certain forms of Afro-Native alliance and solidarity. So Robert Benjamin Lewis lived in Maine. He was Afro-Native. Another writer, the Pequod intellectual and um, preacher, um, William Apis was also a part of this group. So this, I kind of love the fact that um, this kind of shared desire to critique and kind of take down notes on the state of Virginia becomes this really important site for black and indigenous solidarity during this period. It's just sort of like this thing, like everybody's like, oh yeah, we can definitely get on board with that, right? Um, so that's sort of why and how Thomas Jefferson is really important to this story. So with that, that intellectual network, mostly composed, I think mostly men, um, and one thing that that group does is they are sort of at pains to um, take down these arguments about the intellectual inferiorities of peoples of African descent. And the un unfortunate thing about that is that the focus on sort of um, uh, the intellect meant that um, different kinds of experiments with the body were sometimes um, sort of neglected. I'm not sure if that makes sense. Let me see if I can think of a different way to say that. It was sort of the case that um, uh, so much of the focus was on proving sort of mental capacity that questions of the body and indeed of embodiment sometimes got lost. Um, so that's actually one of the reasons why I really love this section from, I don't know if folks have read um, Colson Whitehead's recent novel, The Underground um, Railroad. I actually really love um, this quote when he's talking about the main protagonist, Cora, um, about, her gra uh, about her grandmother who um, um, survived the Middle Passage and then lived and died in slavery. And so Whitehead says, Ajari knew that the white man scientists peered beneath things to understand how they worked. The movement of the stars across the night, the cooperation of humors in the blood, the temperature requirements for a healthy cotton harvest. Ajari made a science of her own black body and accumulated observations. Um, so I really love the idea of that she made a science of her own black body, right? To think about the ways in which enslaved people, including people we don't have records of or who did, did not ever produce their own texts, right? Or don't enter the kind of print archive in this period, were refusing these kind of regimes of experimentation through practices of the body, stealing the, their own body away, and maybe even studying their own body, right? Making a science of her own black body. And that language of accum accumulated observations is very much that kind of language of empiricism, right? Um, so this is sort of a good segue into a history of um, performative interventions into racial science. Um, and I argue in the book that um, just as these early black science writing are sort of key um, to this history of combating racial science. Um, black performance in the United States and also in transatlantic spaces is really key and also makes sort of discrete interventions into racial science in this period. Um, so again, you could say, oh, well, performance like dance, lectures, these kinds of things, those aren't science, right? So how can it be a scientific inter intervention? So this is a period when a lot of science is being performed publicly, right? And a lot of scientific um, culture actually takes shape through lectures and public performances. Um, so what I sort of found in my research was that, you know, I think now because of how we think about science being up here, being sort of hegemonic, practiced, I don't know, right, in, in academic settings, um, practice in research labs and pharmaceutical companies, right? And then we might be down here sort of resist, resisting things or responding or whatever that relationship is. Th that's not how things are operating during 
during this period, right? The anti-racist response to racial science is happening in a very similar sort of set of networks, right? Um, and that was a really important research discovery for me while I was writing this book. So for example, if you think about these phrenologists, this, these, physiologi these physiologists, these guys who are um, making these claims about polygenesis, a lot of the, the dissemination of that knowledge is happening in spaces like this, right? Um, um, and so you would have cases where African-American um, bands, um, performers, lectures would sometimes be happening in adjacent or sometimes in the same venues, right? Um, and so I have a little anecdote in my book about um, the famous phrenologist, Scottish phrenologist George Combe, who in, I can't remember the year, You'll have to read the book to, re to, to find out the year. I can't remember what it is. But in Philadelphia, he was performing, he was giving a lecture on phrenology in the same venue where Frank Johnson was performing. And Frank Johnson was a black band leader. He was kind of like a big band leader of the, the kind of antebellum um, period. Um, and so Frank Johnson and his band had just come back from Europe. They were on this big tour. Um, and they come back to Philadelphia, and it's sort of their welcome home performance. They're very popular. And they were were performing on the upper level of the venue. And Combe complains, first of all, he had so many less um, people at his talk than at Frank Johnson's performance, and that clearly pissed him off. But then secondly, he, the band and the kind of raucousness of the crowd was actually drowning out what he was saying, right? Um, and I just think that is a great moment that captures something about, um, the, you know, it's a kind of sonic intervention into racial science and this moment of kind of a performance of, of a black music and indeed vitality, right? In opposition to these forms of moribund, death-bound comparative anatomy, right? Which were invested in sort of investigating racial racial science, including on cadavers, right, on people, that, that kind of opposition there, the fact that this racist phren phrenologist, his words were actually drowned out by this band, I think gives you a sense of um, how some of these performance cultures were intersecting with racial science during this period. Another really important, really embodied intervention into racial um, science during this period happens in 1854. Um, this is a pamphlet that's based on a lecture that Frederick Douglass gave at what um, was then Western Reserve College and today is Case Western in Ohio. Um, so this was a speech where Douglass went to this graduation ceremony he actually collaborated with a white scientist at the University of Rochester. Um, and he is responding to the publication of a really vicious work of racial science from the period um, that was called Types of Mankind. Um, and so it's a, the, the, the um, speech itself is a kind of direct takedown take of these forms of, of um, racial science and specifically of polygenesis during this period. Um, so, um, but I would also argue that his intervention into polygenesis was a deeply embodied intervention. Um, so you might think about the fact that we see these words on the page, but Douglas was giving this critique of racial science while he was at a podium. Douglas was known for his kind of physical, his kind of physical presence, his a certain type of black masculinity, indeed a kind of muscularity. At the same time, he had a reputation as being an, an extremely eloquent and learned speaker. So you might think about the significance of his person, that his very person um, destroys the theories of polygenesis in terms of his performance of both mental, mental and physical capacity on stage, right? Um, so you might even just kind of imagine and think about Douglas right there on stage. Um, he was also, for this speech, he was invited by a student group. Um, and I think this sort of resonates with some of the politics at universities today around um, issues of free speech, um, sort of acts of dissent and activism among student groups who are um, not happy with certain selections, and then student groups who actually um, campaign for and invite other types of speakers. Douglas was invited by a student group for the graduation, um, and there was a huge controversy about his invitation, right? This is 1854. Um, this is um, a controversial that he's there. 
Um, and um, I think it's really kind of significant to think about the fact that the polygenesis, their arguments um, about racial inferiority and this kind of anti-black science responses when it's actually coming from a former slave, right? I um, mean, you sort of imagine, I sometimes like to imagine Douglas like up on the stage and seeing some maybe scientists, maybe people who work at the university who adhere to these theories like, oh fuck, right? Like this is like, you did not mess around with Douglas, right? So it's kind of amazing to see, sort of think of him on stage there. Um, so I just included this quote because I think um, you might have a sense of, Douglas just like destroys the actual theories of polygenesis, but this gives a little bit of insight into those more um, kind of utopian dimensions of what he believes could actually be made possible with science and technology. So he says, it is somewhat remarkable that at a time when knowledge is so generally diffused, when the geography of the world is so well understood, when time and space in the intercourse of nations are almost annihilated, when oceans have become bridges, the earth a magnificent hall, the hollow sky a dome, under which a common humanity can meet in friendly conclave, when nationalities are being swallowed up and the ends of the earth brought together. It almost sounds apocalyptic, doesn't it? It, yeah? um, I say it is remarkable, nay, it is strange that there should arise a phalanx of learned men speaking in the name of science to forbid the magnificent reunion of mankind in one brotherhood. A mortifying proof is here given that the moral growth of a nation or an age does not always keep pace with the increase of knowledge and suggests the necessity of means, oh, this is quite a sentence, the, of means to increase human love with human human learning. Um, one thing to note, this image of the earth, a magnificent hall, Douglas is basically imagining that the world is turning into a kind of lyceum space or a kind of lecture hall. This is amazing being in this space. You can imagine a space like this, right? That's in a kind of utopian idea about thinking about um, sort of um, people's participation in science. This is also a period in which African Americans um, in the North, for example, could not be sure of their admittance to scientific lectures, so it's significant that um, Douglas gives us this image of where the whole world itself sort of becomes a kind of scientific lecture hall, right? And then also I'll just finally point out to you that final clause where he talks about the necessity of means to increase human love with human learning um, gets at that idea that like that um, something like a politics of love is necessary to overcome these forms of polygenesis. So I think there's a lot going on in this, in this speech. Okay, so I just have two quick examples to close up with for tonight. I wanted to just say something about um, Henry Box Brown, who's in my performance chapter. Um, so um, Henry Box Brown was another um, former slave. He sort of um, reached national and international fame after he shipped himself to freedom. He was packaged into a box. He was um, sent through a private postal service um, from Richmond, Virginia, where he was enslaved to the anti-slavery office in Philadelphia in 1849. During this period, there's a um, pretty robust history of formerly enslaved people who sort of get linked up with the abolitionist movement once they reach north, realize um, that there are some limits to certain forms of mainstream abolition, and then break from it. Frederick Douglass famously does this. Box Brown doesn't mess around with the Garrisonians for very long. He very quickly, he's sort of like a couple months in, he's like, Ooh, I'm out of here. Um, so he ends up traveling to England. And in England, in the UK, he will actually um, perform as an anti-slavery lecturer and as a popular entertainer for decades. Um, this became, becomes really his life's work. Um, when Box Brown um, arrives in England, he's often working in the factory districts in England. So he's working, um, he's talking to the British proletariat, right? Um, who see some resonances between their own um, kind of exploitation as industrial laborers and the kind of labor that um, Box Brown was performing um, in um in Virginia when he was a slave. 
And when he first starts performing, his lectures um, looked much closer to kind of a standard anti-slavery lecture. Um, but while he's there, he gets really kind of influenced by um, the other forms of popular entertainment that are happening in England during this period. And this is a period in the mid 19th century when the popular science, um, the popular performance of science and medicine is really huge. Um, so it's clear that he was traveling with some of these, uh, these um, traveling scientists, these performers. Um, he learns um, mesmerism from a British mesmerist. He starts doing hypnosis on stage. And basically, his performances become more and more kind of hybrid and eccentric. It becomes a little bit closer to a kind of variety show, right, um, as, he, as he continues to perform in England. Um, and it becomes clear, I mean, I think part of it is he sees a market for doing less, um, kind of performances that incorporate science and technology. So I think that's definitely part of it. Um, but I think that he also was sort of interested in ways in which, again, his sort of forms of performance could really challenge these forms of science at the period, in the period. Um, so one of the things that happens is his own box um, he repurposed in his performance. Um, so he, once he starts doing hypnosis, the box kind of um, signifies as a magician ch chest. He would um, dramatically restage his, his escape. Um, he would draw on resonances between the box and a coffin to talk about the kind of history and status of slavery. Um, and then finally, I have this kind of electromedical device because this was a period in England when there were these kind of little medical, electromedical and scientific apparatuses everywhere on these popular performance circuits. So I've sort of speculated the ways in which um, Box Brown's um, box actually also s signifies in that way. Okay, so my final figure, I just thought I would say something about the image that dawns my book. Um, so this is um, a butterfly that was um, painted by a woman named um, Sarah Maps Douglas. It was contributed to something that was called a friendship album. She um, contributed it to the album of her friend, Amy Matilda Cassidy. Um, and these albums were basically, um, they were like blank books that you would pass among your friends and you would inscribe like little friendship tokens, pieces of verse. It was basically a way to kind of solidify friendship bonds. Um, so Sarah Maps Douglas was born nominally free in antebellum Philadelphia. Um, she was an abolitionist. She was a um, she attended Quaker meeting. Um, she was very politically and socially engaged, um, and she also. Um, um, attended um, classes at two different medical colleges in Philadelphia. She was a teacher at the Institute for Colored Youth, an all-black school in Philadelphia for decades. Um, and it's become very clear to me that part of the reason why she took medical classes but did not graduate, which was actually pretty common during the time that you would take some classes but not actually get your medical degree, right, was that she had this interest in um, uh, gaining this medical training and this knowledge in order to bring back this information to her community. So at the Institute for Colored Youth, she develops a science curriculum. She was doing a kind of night school for parents of students at the school and other community um, members. She had a kind of, her students often remarked upon her amazing scientific cabinet that she had constructed, right? Um, and I, I even found a couple of little archival hints that she may have conducted experiments on stage at this, at this night school. Um, so she was a really interesting and important figure. Um, she kind of was like single-handedly um, responsible for um, training young black women in antebellum Philadelphia who went on to become physicians. Um, so she's sort of this kind of lost and neglected figure. Um, I just wanted to close with this image um, because when we first look at it, it sort of just looks like a nice, pretty sort of floral image, right? But I want you just to take a, I don't have a red pointer, so I'll just, I'll just point. Note the technical and anatomical specificity of this image, 
And it's actually an image that's just not a floral painting that operates within these sort of sentimental networks, but it's an image that looks very close to what images of butterflies in insect textbooks and scientific textbooks look like during this period. Um, and I would argue that what we see, even though you only see one image here, but across these friendship albums, there's other natural history discourses, other images that suggest that these um, albums were not just records of sort of um, black women's friendship and intimacy, but that were also um, recording forms of scientific education and a form of study, right? So I'm sort of interested in how um, these objects reflect that. And then the final thing that I'll just say, and then I'm guessing that since I've really stuck close to the 19th century, you might have some questions about contemporary iterations of fugitive science, which I'm happy to talk more about, to think about maybe some other and later histories of fugitive science. Um, but just to close, I would maybe ask you to look at the blackness of the butterfly. This is a watercolor image, but the black is in gauche. It's an oil painting, right? Um, I think that in terms of thinking of this history of fugitive science, that kind of racial dimensions of the butterfly, like why does she make that a black butterfly is really interesting. It becomes a kind of image of black femininity, right? At the same time as it traffics in these forms of scientific illustration. And then also the final thing to say is just that I really like how the butterfly presumes a kind of movement um, that for me is really a part of this history of um, empiricism, right? I talk about fugitive science in terms of the production of knowledge that happens often with um, whatever's at hand. Right, so this, these kinds of forms of making and experimentation, right? Um, it's often a kind of shuttling back and forth, right? Um, and even if we think about something like how slave narratives, or if we even have a certain imaginary about how escapes from slavery took shape, we often think about them as a kind of unidirectional sort of movement from like the south to the north, right? You're enslaved in the south, you move to the north. Um, but that's actually not in reality how it you actually often or usually happened, right? People would often um, kind of go to another town, they would come back, right? You would have to hide out for a while so you could get the rest of your family, right? There are ways that people escape right from within the plantation itself, right? And I just really love how the movement of the butterfly kind of challenges some of the um, um, sort of imaginations of fugitivity as something that just happens in one, one way. Um, and so I would just close to think a little bit about the kind of fluttering of the butterfly and ways in which that links up to this sort of history of fugitive science. Um, so thank you all for listening. I really appreciate it, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Britt. Um, so you, you talk a lot about scientists and artists who are kind of trying to refute uh, a, an anti-black mm -hmm an anti-blackness uh, sentiment, but w did you find any like attempts to maybe pathologize whiteness or examine like the psychological basis of white supremacy in the work that you were examining? Yeah, I mean, I think it happens as part of this, um, the kind of tradition of satirical fugitive science. Um, there's a great writer, William J. Wilson, who's going to be the topic of my next book project, and he writes this kind of speculative ethnology, sort of similar to, you know, you know those those. Um, those proto-evolutionary texts that I was talking about. And he basically just reverses. He reverses everything that these ethnologists would say. And he um, takes the kind of discourse around the sort of racial monstrosity, right, and grotesqueness that is often mapped onto blackness in these texts. And he, and he just does that with whiteness. So he, he and, and, but the, the point there is not to, to, he doesn't believe that. It's actually to show how, um, well, how racist, how hateful, but also just like how ridiculous these forms of polygenesis are. Um, one thing that I sort of realized in my research is that, um, you know, the kind of history of racial science has not gone away, right? And even though these regimes have gotten more subtle, you know, Genomics, for example, presumes certain forms of, of racial hierarchy, right? This stuff has gotten more gentle and maybe a little bit more invisible, but 
they, it still sort of persists in certain ways, right? Um, and one thing that I sort of realized in my research was that because these forms of polygenesis, these um, forms of ethnology contribute do contribute to things like eugenics later in the 19th century, right? And are actually part of that a longer history of racist science. That I think sometimes we presume to think that these forms of earlier science are the same as what happens later. But these guys, they were, it was kind of like, like I said um, at the beginning, the texts are really weird. Like the, these works of polygenesis, like they are, they are, um, imaginative in all the worst ways, right? They're sometimes huge. They're sort of disasters. They don't really look like what we think of. It's very far from something like a scientific article, right? And so I do think it's interesting to think about, like, well, what does it mean that those, they're these weird, these weird kind of compendias, these texts, that that's the origins of, like, what will become um, sort of racial science, something like anthropology or eugenics later in the century, right? Something like Samuel George Morton's Crania Americana, which is a really kind of key text, um, a work of, of craniology. Um, um, I remember the first time that I saw that work, I was just shocked because I had known it as a founding text in the history of scientific racism, which it is. But it's also an art book. <laughs> it, is a, it is a book that is huge, that there is so much expense paid to the binding of the book. The lithographs of, are gorgeous. And I thought, wow, this really messes with how I understand like this history of scientific racism, right? Um, that this is a period, right, where like um, there's an aesthetics to that text, right? Um, and so that's why I actually think that thinking about this history of fugitive science as, as the production of a certain kind of anti-racist aesthetics is also really important, right? Um, because there are also sort of um, aesthetic dimensions of the racial science as well. Thanks for your question. Hi, Britt. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Chris. Uh, <laughs> could, could you just say, maybe kind of coming off of that question, a little bit about, I'm curious how the polygenetic people um, dealt with, responded to, drew from, but also kind of disavowed theories of human difference that come from the Bible, like oh, the yeah. curse of Ham or yeah. Cain or something like that. So just could you say maybe a little bit about the overlaps and the distance between those different theories of human difference? Yeah, so I mean, there are earlier theories of polygenesis that are not hateful, like in the 17th century that are actually um, linked up to histories of like political radicalism, um, like the kind of theories about the question of the 10 lost tribes of Israel, right, that are actually linked up to kind of radical forms of politics early, early on. Um, so in some ways, this is a, a kind of um, a politically conservative, like it's when polygenesis actually becomes reactionary, is actually in the 19th century. Um, um, so I mean, I think that it's hard to say um, the way that they use the Bible is so different in, so, in, in different texts right, that it's like sort of hard to pin it down to one, to kind of one thing. I mean, I think in terms of this history of kind of secularization is that they, there is a kind of um, heterodoxy in terms of like the um, use of exegesis and the use of the Bible. And that's why I think polygenesis might be the sort of important site of the secularization of science. Um, and that in some ways, um, what they were trying to do was, um, had, more in term, had more to do with um, different ways of reading scripture and reading the Bible, and that this racial stuff was just the kind of like sidebar, right? But they really thought themselves to be, that they were kind of innovators, that they were breaking with this kind of tradition. Um, and they saw it as being a kind of heterodox in terms of religious um, and biblical interpretation, but it was read by figures like Douglas and indeed by like Christian slaveholders as just being like a heresy. Um, but it is sort of, I think that this, these ethnologies, if I, was, if I had more time, if I was gonna write another book, um, I think that this is like the site 
we know that science and religion, I'm sure other speakers of this series have talked about the science and religion still intersect in key ways, right? But in terms of the kind of within sort of science and within these discourses, the, the kind of attempt to, to separate them, I think the polygenesis are really kind of um, early figures in attempting to make that happen. Thank you. I was wondering, you talked about, you posited that uh, Jefferson's publication may have been the first moment that um, black intellectuals gal were galvanized to network yeah. among themselves. Yeah. Um, in your research, were there other moments after that that you could really speak mm. to? That's my first question. My mm -hmm. other one is, did they actually, I'm, I'm assuming they were writing to each other, but yes. were there moments of gatherings yes. where they called each other to have a convention or some yes, sort of... Yes, that's a great, thank you for that question. Um, there's like this thing when you write a book and then you realize after the fact how you should have organized it. So one of the things I realized that I could have organized the book around these different networks. So um, these women in Philadelphia, they were intimately connected and they were friends. Um, so that was definitely a site of gathering. They're um, involved with organizations that they, that they found. You know, they're in Philadelphia, they're in the city of medicine, they're in a place, this is like at the, the city that's at the forefront of sort of science and medicine in the period, but they are excluded from most of these venues and these institutions. Um, and so because of that, they start forming their own um, networks of collaboration, their own study groups, they bring in scientific lecturers, they start learning science. Um, and I think the Philadelphia case is a really interesting place to think about like what happens on like um, the, the kind of, what are the, the conditions upon which like structures of exclusion and segregation actually um, um, were the impetus for producing these other forms of science, right? Um, so that was definitely something that was happening. And part of it is that they're learning comparative anatomy and physiology um, on their own because, um, because they're excluded from these spaces, right? Um, and one thing that I sort of realized as I was in terms of thinking about um, um, these networks among black women, um, I realized that some, one thing that happens in terms of a history of science when we talk about um, these histories through disciplines is that sometimes it actually can obscure what was actually happening. So in the case of Sarah Maps Douglas, um, you know, I had read all these things, there are these newspaper reports about how she was teaching anatomy, physiology, and hygiene to her students, including students in her own parlor. And it took me, I'm embarrassed to say, a long time to realize they were clearly talking about their bodies, sex, sexuality, and reproductive health. Um, so I think that this was a really kind of key network where they were you know, really kind of physically collaborating. Um, that earlier network, um, that's a bit more the, the kind of New England early black ethnology network. I mean, that's an intense story because ma many of those figures did not live very long. David Walker passes away in his 30s, right? Um, so what ends up happening is that you see these figures citing one another, but often after the other person has already Already passed, um, so there is a question about how did how was how were their legacies carried out by other writers, um, and it's a sort of that's a little bit more of a spectral history because of the kind of conditions of sort of life and mortality in that period. Thank you all for um, for coming and listening tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>